Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. Welcome back to Live from the Heartland. This is for the week of uh, March 23rd in the year 2024. And I'm still Michael James, and it really gives me a lot of pleasure to bring on our next guest for this segment of Live from the Heartland, a longtime friend, Flint Taylor, a progressive lawyer who goes back, along with me and a bunch of other people still around, to the days of the Rainbow Coalition with the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords Organization, the Young Patriots Organization, and Rising Up Angry. He is the author of a really wonderful book called The Torture Machine, and uh, uh, he is a man who was on the scene just after Fred Hampton was assassinated by uh, the Chicago police and the FBI. He worked on that case. He worked on the Attica prison case, and for many years, he's been involved with the Burge torture case. He's been fighting for justice from courtrooms here in Chicago all the way to the Supreme Court. And this week, I got an email both from Flint Taylor and also from Andy Thayer talking about a joint statement on behalf of Jackie Wilson by his lawyers. Uh, Flint, why don't you tell us what that says? And good morning to you. Good <laughs> morning. Afternoon. And and we do go back that far. Uh, we do. That's, that's, that's a ways back these days, isn't it? It's getting um, to be. It is. It's great Thank, to be with you. Thankfully, we're still here. Yeah, yeah. It's great to be with you. Uh, yes, it was uh, it was a really good day for uh, Jackie Wilson uh, on Wilson on, uh, on Wednesday and Thursday of this week when the county board approved a record making seventeen million dollar settlement uh, for their role, that being the state's attorney of Cook County's role in his uh, torture uh, by Burge and the thirty six years he spent in the penitentiary after being wrongfully convicted uh, for the killing of two Chicago police officers. And that's the statement that we and the Lovey firm put out jointly because we jointly represented Jackie in his civil rights suit over the last six or actually, let's see how long it's been. We've represented Jackie since 2015. I was involved along with some of my partners in the initial Wilson case, that being Andrew Wilson's case, uh, who was tortured along with his brother, Jackie. Uh, and I got into that case in the mid eighties. So this is a case that has been going on as kind of the centerpiece of the Burge torture scandal uh, and our involvement uh, in it to fight, to fight against torture and to expose it now for uh, 35, 37, 38 years. Well, Flint, for the people who may not know, although if you live in Chicago and you're older, you might remember when the Wilson brothers were uh, involved in an altercation and uh, chased by the police. There was a lot of fanfare and, uh, you know, up to the minute reports of that. Uh, both of them, I believe, went to prison. Um, Tell us more about the origin of this uh, case, as well as uh, filling us in on who John Burge is. Okay. Um, well, back in February of 82, uh, the Wilson brothers, that being Andrew Wilson and Jackie Wilson, uh, were stopped uh, on a South Side Street by two white gang intelligence officers. Uh, Andrew Wilson had a gun on him and also was in violation of his parole or probation. And one thing led to another. And while Jackie stood by, his brother Andrew shot and killed two white Chicago police officers. They then fled. And of course, uh, the entire Chicago Police Department and the power structure in the city of Chicago and Cook County uh, completely uh, lost their mind in trying to find the perpetrators. And they terrorized the Black community. Uh, they kicked down doors. They tortured people. They beat people. Uh, and finally, they landed upon uh, Jackie and Andrew. And they took them to 
Area 2, which was at 91st and Cottage Grove here in the city, uh, a detective headquarters, that Burge was the head of violent crimes. Now, Burge wasn't just any Chicago police officer. He was an officer, uh, he was a lieutenant at that time, uh, who had, for the previous 10 years, headed up a crew of what they call, they called themselves Burge's ass kickers. And they uh, utilized not only your, the traditional forms of brutality and questioning suspects, black suspects, but they used uh, very serious torture techniques, electric shock, um, suffocating people with bags and, and typewriter covers, sticking guns in their mouth uh, and simulating a mock execution, beating with rubber hoses, you name it, they had all those tactics. And they used all of them on uh, Andrew and Jackie Wilson. They got confessions. Uh, the confessions led to the, the convictions of Andrew and Jackie. Uh, Andrew was sent to death row and Jackie got a life sentence. Uh, a few years later, Andrew filed a pro se lawsuit from prison alleging he was tortured. By this time, the Supreme Court of Illinois had overturned his conviction because of his torture. Uh, and he ended up being tried again and getting li two life sentences. Uh, we came into Andrew's case at that point, uh, and we started to uh, uncover the fact that it wasn't just Jackie and Andrew that were tortured, but it was a whole pattern and practice of police torture. And that, of course, uh, over the next 35 years has led to uh, many struggles, many battles, both in the courtrooms, on the streets, not only by the lawyers, but also, of course, by movements, by the families of the survivors of torture, by the torture survivors themselves from prison. And so, uh, ultimately, after uh, two trials, uh, we were able to get a judgment for Andrew Wilson back in the 90s. Uh, and then, uh, many years later, after uh, the, um, the, the city council uh, decided to give reparations to the men who had been uh, tortured. Uh, and um, that's a whole story in and of itself. Um, then Jackie's case was returned back to the courts. And so that's where we were able to establish that his, his uh, confession was tortured out of him. We got a new trial. At the new trial, uh, we ultimately forced the prosecutors to dismiss the case, and the judge granted Jackie a certificate of innocence back in 2020. This allowed him to go to federal court and to sue all the people who had wrongfully convicted him and who had tortured him. And as a result of that lawsuit, uh, Cook County, and specifically, uh, it's my uh, understanding or belief, uh, Tony Preckwinkle, and uh, Kim Fox uh, owned up to the role that the prosecutors had in the torture and wrongful conviction of Jackie Wilson over these many years, which was unbelievable, really almost unbelievable in terms of how deep and widespread it was. And that's where the settlement came in terms of the county of Cook. Now, we still have the case pending against the city of Chicago, and so far, the Johnson administration has been very disappointing in how they have been dealing with torture cases, uh, including and most particularly Jackie's case. And we're hoping there'll be a sea change within the administration to recognize in court what they've recognized out of court politically, which is that Burge and the city had this longstanding pattern and practice of police torture, and that the men who were tortured should be properly compensated for that. So is the $17 million settlement, who does that go to, besides probably some lawyers? Oh, it doesn't, it goes to Jackie. Uh, yes. Yeah, it goes to Jackie. It certainly will be compensated uh, for all the work we put in over these many years. Uh, but it, it is a fair settlement in terms of what the county uh, involvement was, the state's attorney's involvement, starting uh, with Richie Daly and starting with the uh, prosecutor who was in Area 2 and participated with Burge in making sure that Jackie and Andrew were tortured. And then 
uh, was involved in the cover-up. And it goes all the way, Mike, to the present day when uh, one of the prosecutors of, of, um, of Jackie came into the trial, uh, the trial, the third trial, the one we had in 2020, uh, and committed perjury uh, in terms of uh, an informant that he had used uh, in the second trial back in the 80s, and where he was covering up the fact that, that this uh, uh, informant was, he still had a, uh, a relationship with him, and that the informant was still alive in England. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a story. It's, 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 it's a story uh, that certainly uh, is, could be thought to be fiction, uh, but it's actually truth is sometimes stranger than fiction, particularly when it comes to Chicago police and Cook County prosecutors. Well, Flint, there was a lot of back and forth uh, with a lot of congratulations and yays. And, you know, this was a great decision. How big a victory is this and what are its ramifications? Well, it certainly is an important victory uh, it, because for the first time, it really recognizes how uh, deeply involved the state's attorney's office, uh, that meaning uh, the daily regime and then subsequently uh, the divine regime. And after that, the Alvarez machine uh, and regime. And to some degree, uh, not Kim Fox herself, but some of her underlings were also uh, at the very end, uh, trying to, uh, if not cover up, to certainly uh, minimize the, the exposure that the state's attorney had. But the recognition that's now made with this uh, number, uh, which I, I believe is the, you know, a record-setting uh, settlement in torture cases, uh, and as I said, it's only about half of what Jackie should get because he did 36 years in the penitentiary and a good round figure is a million dollars a year for um, for being wrongfully convicted. And so if you do the math, that means the city owes about $20 million on this case. And we're hopeful that they'll step up and, and do right uh, with regard to their share of the involvement uh, given uh, Burge and, and, and uh, his notorious record as a, as a torturer uh, in Chicago. Well, let me ask you a little bit about Jackie Wilson. Uh, how is he doing? I mean, he's been in prison for 36 years. Um, I don't know what his situation is now, but uh, you obviously are in touch with him. Can you talk a little bit about how he is? He, he's, you know, it's, it, it's not easy. You're in prison, you live a certain prison life uh, for 36 years, you come out, uh, much of his family no longer uh, is around. Uh, he's got to look over his shoulder all the time because this is such a, uh, a, a notorious case. Uh, and he has been lumped with his brother, even though he really did nothing in terms of, of shooting the officers. In fact, all the evidence showed that he stood by in total shock when his brother shot the two officers. But nonetheless, he took the rap along with his brother. But so he's carrying that around with him. And even though the, the reports from, you know, now say he was exonerated, you see the right wing uh, pushback. That, that, that horrible paper, The Wire, The Daily Wire, you've probably seen it, uh, some of the prosecutors, uh, and also uh, the family of, of, of the deceased officers and, and the police uh, foundation, uh, which uh, former uh, Superintendent Klein heads up, they all made statements calling him a murderer, even though he has been fully exonerated and been found by the courts to be innocent. So this is what he has to put up with on a daily basis. But he's stayed out of prison now since 2018. Uh, he's doing you know, well, uh, even though he's up against all of this. And of course, it's this is going to be a, a complete life-changing uh, amount of money that he's going to get. And it, obviously, we will help him to uh, make sure that, that it's properly uh, cared for. Um, but um, there's no amount of money, as you know, Mike, that can can 
and compensate you for being tortured and spending 36 years in a maximum security prison. He almost died at one point. He, he went on a hunger strike uh, because they took all his legal materials away. And so uh, he, uh, we saw him at one point in a wheelchair. He wasn't, uh, but he has come back from all of that. Obviously, you, when you come out of prison and not having real health care for 36 years, you're going to come out with, with health issues I'm sure that his lifespan has been shortened by that span in, in prison. Uh, but all in all, uh, he's he's doing very, very well. Uh, and, you know, we, we always, with our clients who come out after being wrongfully convicted and being tortured, we marvel at how much strength they have and how much resilience they have and how much fight they remain to, to, to have, despite all the beatdown that they've, they've suffered over all these years. Well, Flint, let me ask you one more question. Uh, you've been on this for a long time about torture, and we, we assume that there's been torture in police stations, not only in Chicago beyond the Burge cases, but certainly in other parts around the country. Can you just address a little bit uh, the torture phenomena and how it uh, is kind of built into police departments, perhaps around the country, particularly at a time when we've seen a lot of uh, reforms around police behavior that are now being pushed back against, as you just mentioned. Well, um, there's torture and then there's torture. And the torture we saw here in Chicago uh, was likened to the torture you, you'd see in Vietnam, uh, during the Vietnam War against Vietnam uh, prisoners of war and, and civilians. And of course, Burge brought that those tactics of electric shock, of dry submarino, of, of mock executions back from Vietnam. Uh, and that uh, is, I wouldn't call it unique, but was unusual in terms of, of, of this country, of that kind of torture. But the UN uh, recognizes that brutality and psychological tactics during interrogations and holding prisoners is also a form of torture. So that kind of torture is more universal and is still ongoing uh, in this in this city and across the country. You know, particularly with young people who are so uh, juveniles who are so impressionable, and 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 uh, the, it doesn't take a whole lot of psychological torture to get someone to give a confession that in many instances is not the truth, and in many instances is fed to them by those very experienced detectives who know how to get confessions uh, and makes their life easier, obviously, Mike. If, if, if they get a confession, they don't go, have to go out and beat the bushes to find the, 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 the evidence, uh, the witnesses that might support their case. And that's why you get so many wrongful convictions that flow from confessions. And it's counterintuitive to the average person that, hey, a person would confess if they're innocent, if they didn't do it, but if they're coerced, or if, even if just a 13-year-old is told, you can go home if you agree to this, and, 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 and so the child does that, and all of a sudden they laugh in his face, and he's, you know, uh, prosecuted on that confession and spends decades in jail before perhaps... Uh, a lawyer or, or an organization like the Innocence Project takes up his or her case and establishes the, the fact that the confession is false and coerced. Well, Flynn, I really want to thank you for uh, taking this time to appear on the Live from the Heartland show once again. Uh, we've had you on many times. You've done great work, and uh, I'm really glad to be your friend, and I do appreciate, on behalf of many other people, all the work that you and a whole lot of other lawyer, lawyers, whether it be the People's Law Office or the Uptown People's uh, Law Center uh, and a number of other people who are doing. Uh, there's, there's insurmountable uh, need on this front, and uh, mm -hmm. you're making a big start. Well, thanks, Mike. And, you know, we just uh, you and I got to keep keep keeping on as long as uh, we get the energy and, and the wherewithal to do so. Right on. So whatever you're doing, if you're still running or swimming, keep it up, brother. You too.